Texans Unfiltered. Welcome back to another edition of Texans Unfiltered, a Houston football podcast for your Houston Texans and YouTube channel. I am Young Ari Gold, and today's a little bit of a different episode. We've had players on before. We've had Bill O'Brien on. We've had plenty of people on, uh, but this one is is more of a sentimental thing for me um, as we are joined by Gary and Conley. And Gary, we talked about it a little bit before, but I don't think you realize how big of a fan I was of your game. And also the little little movement I started on Twitter where I changed my Abby name to like Conley Crew because like I was just all these people that pretend to watch film and don't actually watch it were like Gary and Conley's not that great of a corner. I was like, bro, you, you're, you're watching something completely different. You are not watching the actual film. Right. And uh, everybody started to buy in. I was posted clips and threads of you. Everybody started buying. People were changing it to Conley Crew. They all had numbers on the end because you couldn't take the same name. Um, yeah. Anyways, it was super dope. So I don't know if you realize it, but people in Houston really fuck with you and, and loved your game. Yeah, no, I did realize it. Uh, people were hitting me up, and fans still hit me up uh, to this day, uh, just saying like, "I hope you can get back," and you were a good corner for us, and all that. So I definitely feel the support um, from Houston, definitely. Uh, and I didn't know about that the stuff on Twitter, like the Conley Crew stuff. That's dope, though. <laughs> Yeah, no, nah, I mean, fans are fans. There's some crazy people out there. But um, yeah. all right, so and we, and we were talking a little bit about so take us through what happened, because, you, you know, you were signed to the Texans. And then after that, like, you know, we'd see you on IG or, or whatever, but yeah. we knew you were hurt, never knew really what what happened. So yeah. take us through that process to where you're at now. So I got surgery in my rookie year at the Raiders 2017. I had a stress fracture. And I got a rod in my leg. And, of course, me being, like, a first-round draft pick, me wanting to play, uh, wanting to come back quick because I had the fracture and I missed them there the whole season. I ended up getting surgery in November, and I got a rod in my leg for a stress fracture. And fast forward to now, I would have never got the rod if I would have knew what I know now. For a stress fracture, you don't need a rod in your leg. You can just let it heal on its own. Mm. Uh, but coaches, just listening to coaches, doctors, being a first-round draft pick, nobody else to really mentor me or tell me to get, like, other opinions and all that. Uh, and even I did get a second opinion, and still they were saying get the rod. But basically, from that surgery, I just started getting, like, trauma to my leg. Like, because they put the screws in my ankle and, in, like, the top of my knee, which the top of my knee, or, like, right below my knee, which goes through the other side through my uh, peroneal nerve. Uh, so basically just cutting through everything because it's in the middle of my leg, my tibia. So you're cutting through everything that's fine to get to another spot. So they basically just started messing up stuff. And uh, I ended up having this pain in my leg. It's kind of like a Charlie horse in my, my soleus calf area. Anytime I like jump, run, or cut. And it was like real mild uh, at the Raiders. That was the next year, 2018. And in 2019, it started to get worse. It started to, like, throb and stuff. And then I got traded in the 2019 to the Texans. Uh, I ended up playing the week I got traded against the Raiders. And uh, I was playing good, like, but I had to take Toradol every game. And it got to the point where I had to take Toradol for some practices just to get through practice. And there was sometimes I didn't practice. Uh, it was just, like, I was basically just playing on Toradol, basically. And then there got to a point where I couldn't, like, consume food sometimes, like, because I was taking so many pills. And I was just like, man, fuck this. Like, I'm not taking no more pills after the season was over because I wanted to finish the season. Uh, and I was just like, I got to figure this out. So uh, mm. the Texans doctor, Dr. Lowe, he was like, yeah, I think it's coming from the screws. Like, let's get the screws out, blah, 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 which it possibly could have been coming from the screws, but it didn't fix it when they took it out. Yeah. And lack of rehab from the Raiders is why my leg even started hurting anyways in the back of my leg. So they took the screw out of the knee, like by the knee, didn't help. Took the screw out of my ankle, didn't help. So they're like, all right, now, like, what's wrong? Like, because I have, like, throbbing pain. Like, anytime I run, jump, or cut, like, my leg, it throbs like a toothache. And, like, I catch, like, a party horse in the back, and then it gets, like, super heavy. Like, my leg feels like a 100-pound dumbbell. Like, even if I jog, like, walking upstairs, like, it just, it killed. So they were like, oh, well, if it gets, because when I exercise is when it hurts. And then when I stop, 
then like it calms down. But it throbs like later in the night and like all that. So they didn't take that into account. They just heard the part of when I exercise, it hurts. So they thought it was compartment syndrome. So I got a fasciotomy, which is they cut all the fascia out of the like compartment to help the nerves like release or glide. I got fasciotomies of all four compartments. So that's four different cuts on the leg. Damn. That didn't help. So then that was like the first year of like rehab after the 2019 season. Then I got like an EMG, which is a nerve study. Uh, it said like some superficial, it said it was mild chronic superficial per- peroneal nerve pain. Uh, so I got a nerve decompression of my peroneal nerve. That didn't help. And then uh, they said my piriformis was uh, compressing my sciatic nerve. I got that. That didn't help. Then I got my last surgery, which was last April, um, of my sural nerve, my lateral sural nerve, a decompression of that. And that, like, I feel like it helped a little bit, but I still can't run. So I did all that. That was over the course of two to three years now. And I was just doing PT for basically an answer I didn't have. Like, I mean, and I was going to a really good PT. So uh, it it shows you, like, no matter who you go to, if you don't know the answer, if people are just guessing, you're not going to fix the problem, no matter how good PT is. So um, I ended up talking to people from Exos uh, here in Dallas, and they looked over, like, all of my injuries uh, from day one, like, when I got my first surgery at the Raiders uh, till now. And basically, they did like a two hour assessment of just assessing everything like super detailed, like nerve inversion, eversion, like flexing the ankle, like pressure, like just everything. Super detailed assessment, asking so many questions and telling me answers about stuff like that. I didn't even know, like about my my back and my disc and how I had herniated disc on both sides. And I was only told I had it on one side. It just a lot of shit just that I didn't know. And that I've never heard anybody like say specifically, like, um, and basically she was saying, the PT was saying that the nerve from shit damn near my back to my leg, it's like, it's not gliding or connecting right. And it's obviously from all the trauma to my leg and then I started compensating. So it got all the way up to my back. So it started in my leg for sure. And basically they just rehabbing and working the muscular and neural side of of all of it and uh like getting the fascia out as well. Um but I told him I was like I'm not having any more surgery. So if I gotta have another surgery to play, like I'm done. So if this doesn't work out, like I'm just hanging it up. But my goal is definitely to get back in the league. So that's basically what's been going on the past two or three years. That's fucking wild <laughs> to like think about, bro. Like, like the no human being should have to go through that, let alone a fucking athlete that has oh, the re- like the resources and the ability to yeah. go see anybody. <laughs> and it just shows you, bro, like this yeah. fucking healthcare system is it's awful. It's another conversation for another thing, another day. But it's I'm sorry awful. you're going through that, but I'm glad to know that Exos and then what you're working on in Dallas is is working because I mean, especially with you living in Houston, like Houston yeah. would be a good fit, but I mean how much of is it how much right now of it is more mental than physical like where are you at with that space because that's got to be a different like yeah uh mentally like when i first well shit i mean when i was taking toward all during the season i was just like man like what the fuck is wrong with my leg and then like the first year or so like doing the surgeries and rehab i was just like damn like i can't fix this like I don't know what the fuck to do. And then as I started seeing, cause I seen like this guy, he was like a neuro specialist uh, in uh, California, but he was like, he wasn't a doctor, but he was basically like a doctor, but he said he didn't want to be a doctor cause he said he hates doctors or whatever, but he's like really smart. And it was all this shit I was looking up about nerves and like basically what I'm feeling. And like when you're injured and you can't get back, you just start Googling and looking up everything. So I'm thinking like, oh, it's this, it's that, it's this, it's that. Because I see just symptoms of something that I feel. So I think it's this and I think it's that. So, And then when I went to him and then my acupuncturist from Oakland, she was really good. Uh, but it's just I lived in Houston, so I couldn't get to them all the time. But they were really right. confirming what I was feeling and what I was saying. 
So as I got to them and then I started to get like answers from them, that's when I started seeking like help in Houston uh, from the PT that I was going to that actually helped me a little bit. And then uh, when I got here, it was just like, well, even before I got here, I felt like the stuff that I was seeing and reading was how I would fix it. So it started giving me like confidence mentally, like I can't fix it. Like I don't need surgery because they were talking about doing another surgery again. And I was just like, no, I don't need surgery. I can fix this without surgery. But um, EXO is like kind of confirmed like what I was feeling. And I feel like I've made progress already as in I can jump a little bit without pain, um, like light jumps and stuff. So I think mentally mm -hmm. I got back to saying like I can break through this as I read and got answers confirmed from different uh, people. And you're still young, bro. Like, how old are you now? 27. Just still super young, yeah. bro. Like, you can still, <laughs> you yeah. still got a lot of time. Uh, it's funny because, it's because like, I, I have a sciatic nerve issue that, that like, popped up maybe, like, 45 days ago. Yeah. And, and I, I won't go to the doctor. Like, I, I already know. Like, I've seen people I've read online about, like, back and, like, how they're diagnosed and it's pretty much always surgery that doesn't fix it. Then you go back for another surgery that doesn't fix it. So I actually had my first, I had my first acupuncture visit today at 420. I've never done it, but supposedly it can help. No, it's going to help for sure. <laughs> oh, for real? Oh, thank yeah. God, dog. Cause I, I can barely sit. In Houston, I was doing acupuncture damn near four days a week. Uh, and it was helping, but it's just, it, it's temporary for what I had. So like yeah. when I would get acupuncture in my back and like my glutes and stuff, it helped a lot. But for my nerve and stuff like in the leg, it would temporarily help. So I knew that it was a problem down there. Right. We just had to figure out the exact problem, but the acupuncture definitely helps for sure. Oh, uh, that's good to know. Uh, and then you also have another victory that, that, you know, you talked about a little bit on Twitter a couple months back, but some shit happened at Ohio state uh, with yeah. a female and you went to court. You, you didn't even like you were like all in. You you went and fought a battle that most men won't fight. Most men yeah. will settle or, you know, what I, I guess take us through that. And what made yeah. you want to clear your name so badly where it was like, I'm not fucking this isn't going to stick with me for the rest of my life. Yeah. Uh, so it happened after Ohio State. It happened in March. It was in Cleveland. Mm. Uh, we were out. Uh, it was like me and my family, uh, like my brothers and sisters and my friends from Ohio. We were out like just regular night, like just going uh, to a bar in Cleveland. Uh, and I met the girl or whatever. And the incident happened in March and nothing happened. Like, like the girl got mad. It was crazy. I didn't even have sex with her. She got mad that I kicked her out, I think. And she had a boyfriend the whole time. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realize until we got in the case like if i would have knew that well, she wouldn't even ever been with me um but basically nothing like happened to where i thought it would be a rape case and then um i remember my friend was telling me like a week or it was like a couple days or a week later uh that the girl because there was another girl in the room that he knew that didn't know the girl that claimed rape of me uh that she was going to file a rape case. And I was just like, what? Like, what you mean? I didn't even fuck her. Like, why would I have a rape case? <laughs> but basically saying that, so I'm just like, what the fuck? So I told my agent and everything. So we were just like prepared for it. But that was like literally a couple of days or a week after it. That was March. And then nothing happened. So I'm just like, oh, maybe it was just rumors, whatever, whatever. Yeah. And then the day before the draft, I fly into Philly to go to the draft because that's where it was that year. And we got there. It was me and my agent. I didn't even get to check in. Like, as soon as I was about to check in, the, the NFL media guy, he came up to me. Uh, he was like, pull me in a conference room, me and my agent. He was like, do you see the news? And I was like, no, nah, like, I was on a flight. Like, what do you mean? He just turned his computer screen to me and it was just showed it said, like, rape case. And I was just like, what the fuck? And then he was like, uh, he was like, I know this is crazy. He was like, uh, we have like a lot of media events set up for like all the players like that could possibly be drafted, all this stuff. He was like, so you're going to be bombarded with questions and all that harass. He was like, so you can stay or you can go home. I understand. 
And I got the next fight home. Like, I was like, nah, I'm not about to do this. Right. So that shit came out. And then I ended Still up, went first round. Yeah, I ended up going home, like, within the next hour or so. And I see reports like, oh, he's going to drop. He may not even get drafted. Like, and then I'm just thinking, like, fuck the draft. Like, I might go to jail. Like, right. It's, it's rape, getting raped, that's 10 years in jail. Like, so I'm just like, and then I had a baby on the way that was due in June. So I'm just like, bro, like, what the fuck am I going to do? Like, because I know I didn't do it, but you know how court systems is, like, you could still yep. get found guilty. So. I'm just thinking about like what I'm gonna do. Not even worried about the draft. Uh, so the next day, the out like a couple hours before the draft, the Ravens called my agent. Like we want him to do a lie detector test, polygraph. So I ended up doing it, and uh, I ended up passing it. And then I had like hit up all my teammates from Ohio State that were like already in the league that had left to like tweet it out and everything. So it was like go viral, or whatever. Yeah. And then of course the teams like. They they sent it to the teams, the Ravens, uh, and then uh, it just got out. And of course, teams have their own inside sources, so they did their like due diligence or whatever. So I ended up still getting drafted, thank God. Uh, but I went through the case, the criminal case. It didn't even get to the grand jury. Uh, it, it got to the grand jury, but it didn't like go past that. Uh, and they didn't indict me. I got a no bill. So I'm thinking like, oh, it's over, like, because I had two eyewitnesses in the room, like, yeah, in the incident, and then I did a polygraph, and then I did a rape kit, and I had no DNA on or anything, so did that, beat the criminal case, and I'm just like, oh, well, it's over. So, and that was, it didn't end until I think midway through my rookie season, or possibly even after, and then basically like a year later, like around the draft in 2018. She filed a civil case. And I was just like, bro, like, what? So I, didn't, I didn't know what a civil case was. I thought it was just like <clears> another <throat> case. Go to jail again. I'm like, bro. So then I figured out what a civil case was through my lawyers, like, talking about it's like for money and blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, she's just trying to get money. And it got dragged on, like, I guess courts, when they have like civil cases, like, they just drag them on and they try to do like the criminal cases and like importance of cases, I guess. I don't know. Um, so it's just dragging on. They set a date and then uh, for mediation, they try to get me to settle. She said she want like 10 million or something crazy. <laughs> no, like I'm not. No, because I know I'm innocent. Then uh, it got like another date for set to have a hearing and then there's another mediation to settle. And then she's like, Oh, okay, well I want 5 million. And I'm like, no. So I just kept doing that. And then they set like a trial date and I was like 20, I think that was like the beginning of 2019. Okay. And, and something happened where it just, the judge wasn't available or something just got pushed back. So it just kept getting pushed back. Then COVID happened. Then it got pushed back again. Then it got pushed back again. Then actually our judge that, we had he died so it got pushed back again and then God damn. Like, yeah it just it was crazy and then like it was like a last mediation where she wanted to settle and then she was like oh well, i want uh i think it was like five hundred thousand. or it was just numbers are just crazy so i was just like nah like if i settle it would be what i would pay my lawyer because i'm gonna have to pay my lawyer anyway right That's the thing i would have settled with and they weren't trying to hear that. So I was just like, well, I'm taking it to trial. So I took it to trial. What That was November of last year. Three weeks, <laughs> like, just crazy shit just happening in there. Like, witnesses lying. Uh, they're showing videos. My lawyer's showing videos of, like, depositions and interviews with cops. And they're literally up there lying on the stand. And then he shows the video, and then it just shows that they're lying in front of the jury. Like, it was just crazy. Cops were lying? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, the, oh, okay, yeah, okay, okay. Like, they were doing it. So they had, like, videos. So, like, the night of the incident, see, I didn't even know any of this happened. So the night of the incident in the hotel is when she was telling the cop that she got raped. Mm. And remember I said the girl that my homie knew yep. telling her. She was on video telling her to like basically say she got raped too like telling the cop man the girl was like 
I didn't get raped. She was like, and you didn't get raped. Like, because the girl knew my, my homie, like, for, like, a year. Like, they were almost, like, dating. But the girl didn't even know that. So she was telling her, like, yeah, you, you got raped. And, like, you need to tell him, da, 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 da. And the girl was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, just crazy stuff. Like, but her and her friends were, like, talking to the cops. And they're saying this. And one of her friends even said, like, she didn't even believe that she got raped. And then she went up on the stand and was testifying for her. And I'm like, y'all are just crazy. Like, so I went through three weeks of that. Uh, and then I ended up actually winning the case. Eight out of eight jurors uh, found wow. in my favor. And uh, uh, found in favor of my counterclaim as well. For uh, I was going to say, did you sue her? Yeah, for malicious prosecution. And yeah. then a, a $300 thing, which was just for like, just to say like, for malicious prosecution basically and like whatever character because i know she ain't got no damn money and right. it would take another long process if i wanted to prosecute for earnings and all that so that's why i did that damn damn dog you've been through the ringer bro yeah it's been a lot <laughs> i no wonder why you play call of duty bro <laughs> yeah. uh, all right so now 2019 you're, you're with the texans obviously we went through like the injury and what happened but I mean, how was your time with the Texans, bro? Like, yeah. you know, it was a kind of a weird time. Uh, yeah. you, you know, Deshaun Watson was ascending, Bill O'Brien. Like, you were part of really almost the end of all of that. So yeah. what was your – like, how did you feel about being here what, what, with everything that happened? Yeah. I mean, like, when I'm I'm in places, I, I observe a lot, but I just be low-key. So there's some stuff, like, I don't be knowing. I just be chilling. Uh, but so when I got traded, um, I told you I played – like literally that I got traded on Monday. I played against yeah. the that Sunday. I, I remember started. when I got traded, um, I met Bill. I felt, I felt like Bill was cool. Uh, I seen, I feel like it's a lot of coaches, like everybody has different interactions and different yeah. stuff. Going. So like some people don't like him because it is this and that. Like I never had a problem with him. Me and him were cool. Um, I thought he was cool. Uh, and I thought he wasn't like OD on anything. So when I got there, uh, he had me do like a walkthrough or whatever, um, but he didn't make me practice full speed. And then the next day it was like Wednesday, I had to practice and uh, whatever. And he told me like, yeah, you're starting this week because I think Roby was out, <laughs> JJ yep. was out. I'm like, fuck, like, let's go. And then it's against the Raiders. Like, I'm like, fuck it, let's go. Yeah. So I ended up doing good. We're doing good in the whole season. Um but, like, him and players, like, some players, they just didn't connect. Like, him and Hop, they just didn't get along. That's uh, life. Yeah, they just didn't. It was just something there. I don't know. But, uh, like, the coaching, there were some coaches that I liked. I, I didn't dislike people as coaches, like, or as people, coaches as people. But I disliked some coaching methods and, like, they just weren't on the same page. Uh, the DB coach at the time, um, he like would just he would just complain about shit and just like point fingers and blame and just he just wasn't really teaching technique or nothing. Like I mean, it's there's usual. no coaching. Yeah, it was usual in the league though. Like a lot of coaches don't they coach scheme. They don't really coach technique. Yeah, coach. But it was just like he didn't. He was just like blaming people. He just he just wasn't a good coach to me. Um, for the DBs, uh, I don't really know what's happening in the offense. I know in that last game against the Chiefs, we had a plan for um, Roby to guard Tyreek. I had Ty, uh, Sammy Watkins, uh, and uh, they put Lonnie on Travis Kelsey. Yep, because it worked them, in the middle of the season. Right, and I was telling them, like, they're going to game plan the shit out of yep. us if we do that again. And I'm like, bro, the playoffs – and I never made the playoffs, but I know. I'm like, bro, the playoffs is different. I'm like, you put yep. a rookie on Travis Kelsey in the playoffs, like, it's going to be a different game. And then I'm telling uh, the coaches at the time, I'm like, man, let me guard Kelsey, like, when we were in a game. Because I'm like, I know how to play him. Like, I played him for fucking three years. Like, we play him twice a year. Like, I know how to play him. And they just – they just wouldn't listen to any of the players, like, just going with their game plan. And we ended up losing – which we were up 24-0, I don't understand. Yeah. But 
I don't understand either, bro. I reached a, a honestly, I reached a, a level of fandom I never thought I'd reach for the Texans that day. I, I, I thought yeah. I'm sitting there with a, at a party like, holy shit, like we're <laughs> we're beating the Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs twenty four zero. I was like, and the scheme looked great on the offensive side of the ball. It looked like Bill O'Brien had a plan. Just, I mean, it was all working, Did and then know? out of nowhere, adjustments. Andy Reid is the king of adjustments. Right. <laughs> And we Bill did O'Brien is not. Yeah, we did not adjust, man. But that season, it was. I feel like it was. It was cool. Like, besides, like the little shit, like with the coaches, and it's like even I think uh, the DB coach I got to it with a player on the sideline, so he ended up being moved to the box or something. They said it was before man. I got there, but they were saying like it was like yeah, he used to be on the sideline. Now he's up in the box because him and somebody got to it. I was just like it's stuff like that, like. We always had some just altercation with a player to player, coach to coach, or coach to player. Just that just messed shit up. Like it just wasn't, it wasn't clear. Um, so I feel like that was partly why, like we lost. Um, and then, like I said, adjustments. Uh, but I feel like the season. But I got there halfway, so I don't know what went on. Before. Yeah, I feel like the season. And then Jack was another thing. Like, is uh, that a real thing, bro? Can you tell? Can you break it down? People think it's a real thing. It's not a real thing. Is Jack Easterby was he a true like little <laughs> finger from Game of Thrones, bro? I mean, I don't know because like like I said, some I people really love talk, him. I, yeah, I don't really talk to people like that. But he would he would just like be extra, like try to talk to me and just be try to be close and like act like we were just best friends and just was phony though. Like you could see it, came it. Off fake. Like, yeah, it's just fake ass energy. Like, that shit corny to me. And then, like, uh, he was just, like, I don't even know. I don't know what his role was, but it was, like, he was the, a head coach, and then it was, like, he was a GM, and then it was, like, I was just, like, what is your role? Like, I didn't even know what his role was. He would give, like, pregame speeches and stuff, and I'm coming to the locker room, and he would come pop in meetings. It's just, like, I'm confused on what your role is. But, um, like, my thing with him – as far as like a personal thing, like I said, everybody has personal things. When I was getting injured, uh, he was just like, or when I was like trying to come back from injury, he was just like there at the beginning and then he was just non-existent when he figured like I wasn't playing. Mm. And he just would like shut off like any communication he had with me. Wouldn't speak if he seen me. Like he always would speak to me when I was making plays and during the season in 19 and then he wouldn't say shit to me if he see me like in the 2020 season in camp or if I wasn't practicing or if I didn't play that game or whatever. And then I remember I had texted him one time to say something and he just didn't hit me back. And then it was just like, I just felt like it was just phony because like he was being all extra like, yeah. the year before. And then it was just like no communication at all after that. Cause I wasn't playing. So it was just like, if you ain't doing for me, I don't really care about you, whatever. That's how I got the vibe from him. Um, and then his, like I said, his just input where he was just like this and that head coach or GM when he really wasn't, it was just like, yeah. it was just bad communication and clarity in the program as far as that. But I feel like the year that I got traded there, we were good. And then, like I said, we got rid of players and it just started to fall apart after that i think that 2019 season the way i mean it's it's where it all started to fall i mean you can point to that one point and say like that's where it all probably bill o'brien probably should have been fired after that game yeah. no reason to keep him around um for half of a season at that point probably should have made right. the decision d hop would still be here there'd be so many other things that would have happened yeah not only that though if you look at the 2019 playoffs at that time that was also when everything was working in y'all's favor outside of that game titans mm -hmm. beat I forgot who the Titans beat, but they beat somebody that they should not have beat. So you guys would have played the Titans to get to the Super Bowl, which yeah. you guys could have beat the Titans. It, it was like the yeah. perfect, was perfect situation, bro. <laughs> it was the perfect situation. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, with Bill O'Brien, I think I've, I have Bill on, Bill on. I think Bill's a cool guy. I think people that don't actually know his his personality and who he is, yeah. I think I think he comes off rough and, and people just – they form their own opinions. I think the media hated him because he didn't want to give them shit during the media, right. like press conferences. And a lot of coaches just don't want to talk about. It. They don't want to talk about injuries. They don't want to talk about any of that yeah. shit. But you guys seem to ask it ten times in a in a fucking press conference, right. and you're mad that the guy gets pissed off. 
Yeah. Um, but as a general manager, I think that's when you know Bill. Bill should have never been general manager. He should have just stayed head coach. Yeah, for sure. But I feel like it was him and Jack because like anytime I met with them about anything, like as far as contract or plan or anything, like he was always in the meeting. It yeah. was like them both at a desk. They're like just talking to me, and I'm just like, why is he even in here? Like, what is he? Like so, did you ever ask him that? <laughs> like, yo, what is I, this guy? Never asked. <laughs> I was in my head, like, I thought he was like team chaplain or whatever they were saying. Uh, but I'm sure he had a big thing in why like Hop left too, because like I feel like they just didn't like Hop for some reason. I don't know. There were the baby mama things that uh, that came out from Michael Irvin. I don't know where basically Bill told. Oh yeah, yeah. De- DeAndre, it. he don't like all his baby mamas. Yeah, baby mom drama or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Corny. Just talking about people with personal life and whatever. That's just corny. You probably shouldn't do that as a head coach. I don't know. It's yeah. kind of strange. Yeah. People don't want to play for you after that either. <laughs> right. That's just corny. What about JJ Watt? What was your like? What was your interaction with JJ Watt? I think a lot of people have this perception of JJ as like the perfect Captain America type type guy and then i hear things in the, in the locker room it wasn't always captain america jj watt like yeah uh i mean me and jj was cool uh, I yeah to talk to him here now and then uh i never had a problem with him i felt like he was a real good dude, real good dude. yeah obviously a great player so great player yeah I felt yeah good. all right so now we're we, 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 you put out a tweet you want to talk about cornerback play you, you're you're trying to venture out yeah. I asked you, tell me about Derek Stingley. And so you wouldn't watch the film. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of his game. I loved him coming out of college. I didn't really like him in Lovey's scheme. I didn't think it fit to his his strengths as a corner. I, I think yeah. this year we'll see the, the strengths of his game in D'Amico's scheme. But what did you see from Derek Stingley when you, when you broke down his film? Yeah, um, I didn't watch his college film, so I don't know if he was. Uh, he was more of a man corner man in, corner. in college. Yeah. It shows. So I kind of was looking at it and I was looking at it like comparing to me when I got in college because I could tell by the way his off man. He yep. was playing press probably a lot and just playing a lot of man. Because so I was like transitioning to playing off man and stuff. In the and league. that's what happened with you and the Raiders, right? Like you, yeah. you were all man corner and then you went and played right. zone. Right, exactly. Uh, but it's not even like zone. It's like a match zone. So it's right. like we, there really is no Unless it's like third and long, and we call like third and eight or more, we call it actual true zone coverage. There's never really a true zone in the NFL. You play zone match, so like we play in cover three, it's man on three unless, or it's man on your outside receiver unless he goes like a slant or something like that. But other than that, it's man. But it's basically off man. So you got to learn how to play off man. And I wasn't ready for off man because all we did was press at Ohio State, like cut splits, stacks, like. We had to press everything. So I was just ready to play man. Like, I got to Lee, I remember, and they'd be like, you can't press this. Or like, I'm like, why? Like, because of scheme, like, you're telling them, like, we're a man, and it's just all a whole bunch of stuff. <clears throat> so it comes with a lot more in, uh, in the league. Uh, and I could see, like, his off-man uh, technique where he'd just, like, run too early or wouldn't stay square, or just, like, shuffle and have too much separation and stuff. I could tell he was, like, a more of a man corner. Um. But he has good patience as far as, like, uh, not breaking on, like, double moves and stuff like that. Um, uh, he's real aggressive um, when it comes to, like, breaking on the ball. Like, his breaking drive is good. Yep. Um, I watched uh, – I only watched a couple games. I watched the first game against the Rams. He did good against them. What about uh, the Broncos? Did the you watch Bron- the Broncos game? I watched that. I watched the Broncos game. Uh, I see – that's where I seen – the off man struggles, yep. um, the separation, uh, where he get lulled to sleep in like a route or something like that. Um, and then Cortland Sun is a big guy. He had a couple of plays against him though on like deep routes or fades in the red zone that he did yep. uh, good against. Um, there was he had one a couple that, knockdowns yeah, on the yeah, sideline. Yeah. yeah, no, he's good though. Um, he's he's gonna get better, of course. Uh, he's just got to do more reps of off man. I watched uh, the Jaguars. He did good because he had a pick, so I wanted to watch that game. Uh, he he ran good. out of the end zone, though, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> Just got to have awareness. Yeah. Uh, 
there. Uh, I think that was the only games I watched. Uh, but he comes up. He's not afraid to tackle. He's a good corner. Um, yeah. I do think uh, this D'Amico scheme will definitely fit him better as well. Well, I think – and we saw it with you specifically coming from the Raiders because when you came here, yeah. it was line, line up with your guy – yeah, and go and and as soon as you did that, bro, it was like yeah. it, it it went right back to your college film, and that's what I was trying to tell everybody. I was like, if you watch his college film in this scheme, he's going to be a lot different than anything you saw on the Raiders, right? And and that's exactly what you did. You never quit. You were always fighting. Um, you were very physical when you needed to be. Uh, yeah. You had a good break. It's just, and I feel like that's a very similar thing with Derek Stingley and what he's facing. And Lovey Two's, you know, Tampa Two scheme, like. Yeah, playing off is just it, it, he, he's gonna have to learn, and it's good for him to learn because you can't yeah, yeah. play man 100% right. of the time. It's not, it so that, that's the way I looked at it, and that's what I told people was like, Look, this is gonna suck for him for a year, but once he gets in, like him taking this experience that he has playing zone and now mixing that in with him going back to playing man, he's gonna be a better corner, yeah, for sure. Definitely, yeah. I was telling people, like, I did a couple podcasts like last week. Um, and then people that just talk to me about football in general, like schemes definitely play a role on players. Like, cause I had my best, or I had my worst eight games of my career statistically in 2019 with the Raiders, the eight games I played with them. And I got traded to the Texans. I had my best, best eight games of my career statistically with the Texans. So I'm just like, and not even just scheme, like organization. Like I didn't want to be at the Raiders. Like I didn't want to go in the building. Like, and it's bad that like, I love to compete at the highest level and I don't even want to go to work. Like it's, it shouldn't be like that. So I'm trying to tell people like it plays a role for sure. Like scheme and coaches, like I didn't like those coaches. Like it just, and it shows like I had my worst eight games, literally my best eight games in the same exact season. Like, and I played against the team that I got traded from five days later. Like, and I got scored on because it was like a, shallow cross and go like those are crazy yeah ass. like other than that like i did good like and i made the game win to play on defense so like yep it plays a, a huge role um in scheme for sure yeah i think um it schemes it, it's an interesting thing when you watch a player get drafted because you have to wonder like are they going to and and i've always said this the texans are in a position now where they're obviously going to be drafting a quarterback they got the second pick yeah and everybody everybody talks about bryce young and I'm not, I have nothing against Bryce Young. I don't know how much of Bryce Young you've watched, but I think Bryce Young is a very good quarterback. But I think he's a scheme fit quarterback. I think he has to go to the right scheme for him to succeed. And I think that's with a lot of players. You yeah. got to play to their strengths to fit your scheme. If yeah. they don't fit your scheme, don't force fit it because one, you're hurting the team. Two, you're hurting the development of the player. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because the player is basically not the player he was when he was. Exactly. Team, yeah. So definitely, um, that I definitely feel that. But like you said, sometimes uh, you just you feel like you can develop a player. So like right. you said, and Stingley and Lovey's like he's not used to it. But if, if he played the second year in it, maybe he'd be better. Like you know what I'm saying? So it could be like that. But but the, but the career is so short, bro. You know yeah, what I mean? Like I, it can be so quick and so short to where like two, three years of development, yeah. you can only put a square into a circle so much. At some yeah. point, that square is still a square. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And um, then, like in the league, it always changes anyway. Coaches get right. fired, players get cut, released. Like, so it don't even matter. <laughs> uh, one thing about cornerback play I wanted to ask you. So when it comes – so back in the day, Revis would do it. Um, Dion would do it. There were a couple of corners that were really good at it, but, the, but backpedal. Mm-hmm. It, in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, backpedaling was a real thing. Now in the NFL, you're not seeing a lot of that. You, 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 very few corners can actually backpedal and turn and transition to run side by side or, or with the wide receiver or tight end, whoever they're covering. Yeah. What is it about that technique specifically that, that makes it challenging? Uh, Well, one, it's the speed of the receiver. Yeah. And these quarterbacks are really good about timing. So it's all about timing. So – and then some corners, and I know I just learned how to do it, like probably late in my career, um, is to see the quarterback at first before snapping the ball or see both the quarterback and receiver. Some can like look at the quarterback, snap the ball, and then see if it's a three-step, 
five step, whatever, and they get their eyes back to the receiver. I can't do that. So I try to look at peripheral. I try to look at the quarterback and receiver. Yeah. Uh, or sometimes I just look at the receiver and just try to motor off of him. Uh, I feel like that's a hard start of it. And then just gauging the speed. Like, these receivers are getting crafty. Um, there's a lot of guys that are fast as shit now. Even the big guys are fast. Yep. So it's just like, it's it's confidence in your technique. One, we don't practice it enough. Right. All we do is practice scheme. We don't get enough. So, like, if you do training all off offseason, um, I mean, it's good to do it. But it's just like when I get into camp, I'm not really doing the reps still. So that's a whole nother month of me not really training my off pedal and doing all that stuff uh, as much as I should be. Um, but then just gauging the speed, like it's, it's tough. Like you want to slow read and then pedal and then turn and run when they get like in good separation. But sometimes you wait too long and then you got a panic turn or sometimes you as soon as you turn, that's when they break. So it's just it's it's really difficult just to gauge the speed, and you got different speeds of receivers damn near every snap. So it's it's just tough. I've always I've always that's like been always like my main question when it comes to cornerback play. We had um, damn I'm trying to think of who I had on um, Hall of Fame corner uh, on Antonio Cromarty, and he was talking about backfield and how like young, young corners don't do it and they're not taught it. They're not taught yeah, to do not, it. They're just not, not taught to do it. Not at all. That's why I was saying uh, Stingley like. If he just be more patient in his pedal, like he'd be cool. Cause he had like, I know against the Broncos, he'd like just shuffle really quick or just right. turn and run, and it'd be like a three step slant. He'd like already running. It was just like you didn't even like back pedal or slow read or, or anything like reset. But I feel like it's really not. It's not taught. Like I feel like it's all a scheme in the NFL for sure. Huh. Uh, so the Texans are in a position now. So obviously they have the second pick. Uh, and this is the last thing before I let you go. I know you got stuff you got to do. Uh, there's like a debate going on. The Texans won the last game of the season because they won. They didn't get the first pick overall. They got the second pick overall. Yeah. And every, most people are saying, oh, they should have lost on purpose, that the team should have known to go in and lose on purpose. As a player, bro, like, one, how would you take that? And two, <laughs> like – who plays sports to lose? I'm, I'm trying to understand the concept of like going into a locker room as a head coach and saying, all right, guys, Hey, go risk your body. But ultimately we're going to lose this game on purpose. Yeah. Nah. Uh, they don't, I mean, I ain't never been a part of that. They don't really say that, but I know some coaches or organizations would probably do something. And as far as like, calling a shitty play or whatever just to do I mean, that. Uh, yeah, I feel I feel like they do that, but they don't come in and just say, like, hey, don't play your game today or whatever. Like, everybody plays to win every time. So I, How would you feel yeah. if, a, if a coach said that to you, bro? Man, I'd be pissed off. Like, what? You're crazy as fuck. I'm trying to go out here and win because <laughs> what if you go out there and you do bullshit and then they cut you? Like, that's So yeah, that's I, the way I looked at it. I'm not going to give a fuck about you. <laughs> well, and when I was telling people, was like, bro, like you're, you're thinking of like maybe Laramie Tunsil and like Derek Stingley and Jalen Petrie, but you're not thinking about the other 40 players that are yeah. playing, are putting good film on tape. Right, for other teams. That, that is going to try to be on the next team that they're going to be on next season. Like exactly. you think they're going to go out there and lackadaisically play? No. Nah, it's not how it works. No, nah, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I don't think. I don't think a coach would be dumb enough to say some shit like that. I think he'd get out to the team, yeah, for sure. But I definitely feel like coaches would do some shit like calling just shitty players or just not giving their full effort because they want to get picks or whatever. I can see that. That was the one game where we actually didn't do any of that um, and actually looked like a competent team. It was yeah. the only game of the entire season. Um yeah. And I think that's what pissed most people off was just the fact like it was guaranteed to get the first round pick. And it's like now Davis Mills looks like a good quarterback and everything. Honestly, else. They no. probably were playing for lovey. Like, they, right. They probably felt like they were bullshitting him and like, no, nah, we're going to finish this shit out and show it all that it ain't him. Like, you know what I'm saying? Possibly. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, uh, you're going to go viral for that one. I'm going to, I'm going to cut it out at the end. I'm like they were doing it for lovey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right bro well um man thank you i appreciate it bro thanks for for having coming on and thank you for just being transparent and having a good conversation um love to do this again in the future if you got time yeah. maybe uh maybe you could watch some texans games this year and we could 
get an update on your 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 PT and rehab and how all that's going, and then we'll see you in the jersey hopefully soon. Yeah, hopefully, man. Appreciate you having me on too. Yeah, absolutely. Thank <laughs> you.